take me I am pressing into you Lord you fight my every battle and I will not fear I am not alone I am not alone You will go before me You will never leave me I am not alone I am not alone You will go before me You will never leave me You amaze me Retain me You call me as your own You amaze me Retain me saying that I've really believed in for most of my adult life and it says this there's not much good in singing unless you have something good to sing about and I believe that with all my heart and I think it's going to ring true until the day I take my last breath so stand with us this morning we're going to sing a song called sing 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 loud Sing, 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 grateful that 
at the foot of the cross where grace and suffering meet you have shown me your love through the judgment you received and you've won my Yes, you've won my heart. Now I can trade these ashes in for beauty. And wear forgiveness like a crown. Coming to kiss the feet of mercy. I lay every burden down at the foot of the cross at the foot of the cross where I am made complete you have given me life through the And you've won my heart. Yes, you've won my heart. Now I can trade these ashes in for beauty and wear forgiveness like a crown. Coming to kiss the feet of mercy, I lay every burden down at the foot of the cross. I trade these ashes in for beauty and wear forgiveness like a crown. Coming to kiss the feet of mercy, I lay every burden down at the foot of the cross. Yes, you've won my heart. Now I can trade these ashes in for beauty and wear forgiveness like a crown. Coming to kiss the feet of mercy, I lay every burden down at the foot of the cross I trade these ashes in for beauty and wear forgiveness like a crown coming to kiss the feet of mercy I lay every burden down
triumphal entry and I want you to think about this because so many times churches simply go through the religious actions of Easter oh we have the Easter egg hunts and we have a special time we have this this meal or we have this get together and we have a cantata for the choir there's all these little religious so-called services we do but it's not about a group loving Christ it's about you loving Christ it's about me loving Christ we can come together in a church full of people calling ourselves Christians, yet not realizing it was my fault he hung on that cross. And I want you to be thinking about this week. It's called Passion Week. There's a reason for that. There was a lot of choosing going on during this time. First of all, they chose the sacrificial time. Did you know that Jesus' sacrifice was planned? Did you understand that? It is set in time it was done on palm monday that doesn't sound right does it but when you go back through and you look at the timeline it had to be on monday you know how i know that because i have a commentary that says it right no here think about this you go to the passover that's what they're celebrating this week the passover the Passover on the 10th day of nisan it's when they would choose the Passover lamb. On the 10th day, in A.D. 30 and 33, the two dates that actually I think Jesus died, according to the Julian calendar, that day was Monday. On Sunday, Jesus would have been in Bethany with Lazarus and Mary and Martha. He would have been sitting there amongst all these people when this lady Mary comes in. She was a prostitute, and she had a jar of costly perfume and she broke the jar and poured it on his head and poured it on his feet and dried her tears with her hair on his feet on that Sunday Jesus was anointed for burial the sacrificial time was chosen now the Mount of Olives where they went was actually 2660 feet above sea level it overlooked the entire temple they went in to find where the Mount of Olives was. And John MacArthur says, This historical event account tells us it happened. Jesus rode in on Monday. On our Palm Sunday, he would have been together with his friends and his family because Passion Week was just about to begin. And he rides in, and there's no coincidence also. Look, there's reason for this day being on this because the, the sacrificial lamb was chosen. When he rode in, on that Monday, they said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the sacrificial lamb was chosen. It would be Christ. It would be Jesus. Then you see they chose a sacrificial lamb. They chose a perfect one. The Hebrew writer says, We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The sacrifice was to be once for all. For centuries, people of God have been keeping rituals to remind them of the promises of God spoken through Moses. However, the blood of those bulls and those goats could never take away sin. Now, you look in the Old Testament and you find all these different offerings, these different, you know, sacrificial offerings, and everything either set sin on side or it covered up sin for just a little while, but somebody had to come by and clean it up. When John first saw Jesus on the seashore, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Folks, I don't care how good you are. I don't care how much good you can do. All you can do is set sin aside and cover it up. Without Jesus, it's still there. The prophet says that our perfect righteousness is as filthy rags. The best you can do is still not perfect. In order for God to restore his relationship with his creation, he had to sacrifice himself. A perfect sacrifice. 
It was a timely one also. Galatians 4, 4, and 5 say, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. There was a time set aside. God knew when the law would lead to the true covenant. And he sent his son to finalize the promises. Now, let's start in the, in the text. He starts choosing the sacrificial entry, verses 1 through 5. And it starts with this transportation. Now, he says, guys, go into the next city. Now, this next city, Bethphage, was actually like coming into Center Grove before you get to Tullahoma. Okay? This is where you would go. You don't go downtown Tullahoma to get a mule. All right? You're not going to find one. You need to come out here and find one out here. Well, what happened is they couldn't really see where the transportation was, but Jesus says, go into the next village. There's going to be a donkey there, and next to that donkey is going to be her foal, and you get both of those, and you bring them here. I used to think, why in the world does he need two? Why would, is Jesus sitting on the big one, putting his feet on the small one? Why do you need two? But the point is, the little foal was going to be coming. It had never been ridden. It would have been reserved for Jesus to ride. For the first time. And they brought the mother with it to keep him, keep him calm. And it says that they went and they threw their clothes on there. Here's just a, a little bit of service here, okay? This is a, his transportation. It's got to be nice and comfortable. So they throw all the clothes on him and Jesus gets up on there. The mother donkey was brought to keep, keep, him, uh, keep the little dog, donkey calm. But we learn from the other two Gospels that the colt had never been ridden. It was a gesture of respect and honor to offer such an animal to someone as to say, this animal was reserved especially for you. The Roman rulers rode in on chariots. The high priest rode in on a beast of burden that had proved itself over and over and over. But Zechariah, according to tradition, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous, having salvation. Is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey? This king of kings, lord of lords, comes in on one of them little bitty donkeys. You see those little donkeys running around that kick coyotes in the head? You know what I'm talking about? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, he's a little bit bigger than that. I can see Jesus almost like his feet were dragging. That's not the way a king comes in, but that's the way Jesus did it. Because it's not how he entered, it's who was entering and who was there. The Word of God says his Messiah will be a victor. Jewish people would have their champion just like David. You remember what they sang about Saul and David that made Saul so mad? They said, Saul has killed his thousands, Dave, David his ten thousands. Well, that made Saul mad. Here they're saying, this guy right here, this ruler is going to make David look like a little baby. And boy, they are correct. They just don't know when. So they're expecting. They're expecting him to come. Jesus was simply sanctifying his future army by living a sin-free life, dying to restore the relationship with the Father and his creation. He was training because we can't fight a godly war full of sin. And that's what he's training us for. That's why we're here. The triumphal entry was the beginning of the end for sin that had been piled up for centuries. Jesus would take them out, as Paul wrote to the Colossians, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He set aside, nailing it to the cross. When that cross was put up, it always meant death. You didn't torture somebody with a cross. You tortured someone by beating them with a whip or by beating them with canes or by beating them with clubs with nails thrown through it. There were different ways you could torture someone. You didn't torture them by hanging them on a cross. You killed them. If you were not dead by, sun, by the sundown on that Friday, the Sabbath they would not allow you hanging there. They would go by and break both of your knees out of joint with a sledgehammer. So you would actually hang by those nails and you would die of asphyxiation because you could not exhale the air, the carbon dioxide in your lungs. You could push up on that nail in your feet long enough but when those knees are knocked out of socket, you can't do it anymore. This was a terrible, painful death. Some of it, look, look here, they're going to start choosing the sacrificial service 6 through 11. Now some chose service. Verses 6 and 7. Hosanna was a praise song from the Hallel, which is Psalm 113 through 118. If you read that, that is a praise psalm. They would sing it. 
And it has Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And many people today are open to a Jesus who they think will give them wealth, health, success, happiness, and other worldly things they want. They're all about a Jesus that's going to help them. They're all about a Jesus that's going to take over all their troubles and get rid of everything that, that holds them down. They're all for that kind of Jesus. But that's not the Jesus that came. The Jesus that came was not worried about our infirmities or our sicknesses. He was worried about our eternity. And he came as a peaceful lamb to die for us. Well, they had the service. They did the services. It says for citizens to throw their garments in the road, for their monarch to ride over, symbolizing respect for him and their submission authority. It's like they're saying, we place ourselves at your feet. If you need us, you can walk on us. And they pull the palm branches and they lay those out as a symbol of authority. It's also a symbol of nationality. Finally, Jerusalem, Israel, would be another place. It would be a state. We would have a king once again. They praise him as king, but his kingdom is not of this world. Some people choose service over devotion. Some people church choose working, but some just choose devotion. That's what we're supposed to be doing. But their devotion was a little bit different. Listen, John MacArthur says they were totally earthbound, materialistic, and self-satisfied. They were interested only in the kingdoms of this world, not the kingdoms of heaven. They would have accepted Jesus as an earthly king, but they would not have him as their heavenly king. And there's a proof of that in the last verse. I want you to look. They're talking about choosing the sacrificial Messiah. Look at that last verse, verse 11. Or verse, let's go to 10. It says, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, who is this? And the crowd said, the same crowd that said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. They automatically, they didn't even take them very long where they were going, Hosanna, Hosanna, and four days later, kill him. They're already starting before he even gets in Jerusalem. Oh, he's a prophet. He's just a prophet. You know, you know where he comes from. Folks, he wasn't a prophet. He's the son of God. He's the one, the only perfect one that can save you for eternal damnation. He's the only one that will get you to heaven. The only one that can, the only one that will be there. For you in heaven. The sacrificial Messiah starts with the Spirit. Now, Jesus was not just a prophet, He is God. And I say is because He's still around. You go over to Jerusalem and you find all those tombs. There are about three tombs that they say were Jesus' tomb. You know what all three of them have in Compton? They're all empty. Ain't a person there. You go over and find Muhammad. They say he, he ascended to heaven on a white horse. His bones are in Israel. You go find Buddha. You go find all these other people that say that they're Messiah. And they're all in the ground. Not our Lord. The Father sent the Son. The Son died, rose again, and sent us the Spirit. Then look at the prayer. A prayer of repentance. Now, this is not magic words. It's, it's me saying I'm lost and I need to be found. And then he goes about, we talk about proclaiming. Now, after my salvation is reserved, I tell others the cure for the terminal illness of sin. You proclaim Christ. After being welcomed to the city of David, Jesus goes immediately into the temple. And he has said, uh, Mark says he has a whip. Now, this is the Son of God. This is li little, you know, little lowly Jesus, meek and mild. He has a whip. And he goes in amongst hundreds of people, turning over tables, whipping people, getting them out of the temple courts. He said, you have turned my father's house into a house of robbers when it should be a house of prayer. See, we have churches today that will sit here and say we must be a house of prayer when they're truly a house of robbers. Jesus went into the church and straightened out religion before he died on the cross. 
It's not an accident. The first thing we see him doing before Resurrection Sunday is cleaning up religion. You know, religion still has to do with the law. You can be religious about a lot. I'm religious about combing my hair. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. At least three or four times a day. I even brush my teeth at least twice a day. I'm religious about that. I'm religious. I've been religious for 20 years about coming to church. I'm going to be here. I'm religious about it. But that won't save me. See, religion brings death. Jesus gives life. You can't be religious. You must be a child of the Redeemer. Now, on this Monday the 10th, Jesus would wrote, wrote in, and <laughs> they would have gave him this little political parade. Oh, we're glad you're here. I'm glad everything's going to be fine now. And next thing you know, he goes straight into the church, straight into the synagogue, and cleans house what would jesus do if he walked into center grove knowing our hearts this morning i have a feeling a lot of us will get a tan backside because we're too religious i'm not worried about religion you worry about the redeemer jesus held his last supper which would have been the 13th thursday these religious people the religious people left if you remember to betray him Judas says he went out, and John says, and it was dark. I don't think he just meant the time of the day. His heart was dark. He was placed in a rich man's tomb, sealed with a massive stone. A Roman placed a seal on the tomb. A guard declaring the body was not allowed. Nobody could, could move the stone. And all day Saturday on the Sabbath, there was nothing but mourning. Jesus was dead. Jesus was gone. But on Sundays, the disciples, one by one, began spreading the word. He is alive. Jesus is going to clean up religion. If there's any question about your salvation, if you think you have religion instead of the Redeemer, you need to get that taken care of this morning because Passion Week is here. It's time to get clean. I would much rather clean myself than to have the Father clean me. And that's what we need to do. The triumphal entry. Choices will be made. We saw the choice of the land. We saw the choice of the entry, all the transportation, everything that went into the triumphal entry. But it all comes down to one thing, a choice. And that's what I give you this morning. What is your choice? Let's pray.